guys, it's Miss Simpson and it's time for reading today. Today we are going to talk about facts and opinion. So, wow, my computer is going crazy. So sorry. Um, we are going to talk about fact and opinion, and we are also going to read our next chapter in Gregor the Overlander. Okay, so how can you tell the difference between a fact and an opinion? So in your essays right now, you are doing opinion essays. So I told you, you needed to have a claim. An author makes a claim in a persuasive opinion argumentative essay to, um, to tell you how they are feeling, to tell you what they believe. And then they support that claim with facts and opinions about their claim. So if you wanted a free day, you would have told me, Miss Simpson, I think we deserve a free day because, and you would have told me some facts and opinions. An opinion would be you guys work hard this this um six weeks. That's your opinion. Excuse me, that you guys work really hard. Now, a fact would be it is proven by science that students work better when they are given some free time or some brain breaks. So a fact is something that can be proven. So Harry Potter was written by J.K. Rowling. We can look and we can see on a book, we can see who the author is. So keep that in your brain today because you're going to be finding facts and opinions about Gregor the Overlander and Gregor the Overlander's author is Suzanne Collins. So that's a fact about Gregor the Overlander. An opinion is something that someone thinks, feels, or believes. So Harry Potter is the best book of all time. Now, you might believe Harry Potter is the best book of all time, or you might not. That's why it's an opinion. So here's some clues. Facts are dates, science, numbers, nonfiction, things we see in textbooks. An opinion is something we believe, we think, if it says good, if it says bad. So um, we are going to read chapter 14. And while we're reading, I want you to think of four facts that you know about Gregor the Overlander and four opinions you have about Gregor the Overlander, because we are going to write those down today. So let's go ahead and let's start reading chapter 14 of Gregor the Overlander. Remember, this is one of my favorite, favorite books to read every year to my kids. What just happened in chapter 13? Oh, they got the permission from the bat queen, I guess, to take bats with them on their quest. So they got the permission. They made a battle plan with the bat leader. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sleepy today. They made a plan with the bat leader and now they are off to get there to go to their next place on their quest. So remember, while I'm reading chapter 14, I want you to think of facts and opinions about Gregor the Overlander. And we'll talk about what your assignment is at the very end. Remember, a fact is something that can be proven true. And like Gregor the Overlander's author is Suzanne Collins or Gregor the Overlander is the first book in this series, that's a fact. Um, Gregor the Overlander is an 11 year old boy. That's a fact and we can find that in the book. So be thinking about what are some facts you can write down and what are some opinions you have about this book? All right, so let's go ahead and let's start and see what their next part of their quest is. They flew through dark tunnels for hours. Gregor felt Boots' little head sink down on his shoulder and he let her go. You couldn't let her nap too long during the day or she'd wake up in the middle of the night wanting to play. But how could he keep her awake when it was dark and she couldn't move? He, he'd deal with it later. The gloom brought all Gregor's negative thoughts back. His dad imprisoned by rats, his mom crying, the dangers of taking Boots on this unknown voyage, and his own fear at the pillar. When he felt the bat coasting down for a landing, he was relieved at the distraction. Although he disliked meeting up with Luxa and Henry again, he was sure they would be more smug and patronizing than ever. They dipped into a cavern that was so low, the bats' wings brushed both the ceiling and the floor. When they landed, Gregor dismounted but couldn't straighten up without bumping his hard hat. The place reminded him of a pancake, round and large and flat. He could see why the cockroaches had chosen it. The bats couldn't fly well, and the humans and rats couldn't fight properly with four-foot-high ceilings. He roused Boots, who seemed to enjoy her new surroundings. She toddled around, standing on tiptoe to touch the ceiling with her fingers. Everyone else just sat on the ground and waited. The bats hunched over, twitching at what Gregor supposed were sounds he couldn't even hear. A delegation of roaches appeared and bowed low. 
The humans got to their knees and bowed back, so Gregor did the same. Not one to stand on ceremony, Boots ran up with her arms extended in greeting. Bugs! Big bugs! She cried. A happy murmur ran through the group of roaches. Be she the princess, be she? Be she the one, Tim? Be she? Boots singled out one roach in particular and patted it between the antennas. Hi, you! Go ride! We go ride! Knows me, the princess knows me, said the roach in awe, and all the other roaches gave little gasps. Even the humans and bats exchanged looks of surprise. We go ride? More ride? said Boots. Big bug take Boots ride, she said, patting him more vigorously on the head. Gentle Boots, said Gregor, hurrying to catch her hand. He placed it soft on the bug's head. Be gentle like with puppy dogs. Oh, gentle, gentle, said Boots, lightly bouncing her palm on the roach. It quivered with joy. Knows me, the princess knows me, the roach whispered. Recalls she the ride, does she? Gregor peered closely at the roach. Oh, are you the one who carried her to the stadium? He asked. The roach nodded in assent. I be tempt, I be, he said. Now Gregor knew what all the fuss was about. To his eye, Tim looked exactly like the other 20 roaches sitting around. How on earth could Boots have picked them out of the crowd? Bagus looked at him with raised eyebrows as if asking for an explanation, but Gregor could only shrug and reply. It was pretty weird. More ride, pleaded Boots. Tim fell on his face reverently and she clambered onto his back. For a minute, everybody just watched them pattering around the chamber. Then Vicus cleared his throat. Crawlers, we have grave matters to place before you. Take us to your king. Take us. The roaches reluctantly tore themselves away from watching Boots and led Vicus and Sullivan away. Oh, great, thought Gregor. Here we are again. He felt even less comfortable than when Vicus had left the first time. Who knew what Henry and Lexa might do now? And then there was the matter of the giant roaches. He didn't feel particularly safe in the bug's land. Just yesterday, they had considered trading him and Boots to the rats. Well, at least there was Merith, who seemed decent enough, and the bats weren't too bad. Timp and an, one other roach named Tick had stayed behind. They completely ignored the rest of the party while they took turns giving the toddler rides. The five bats gathered together in a clump and fell asleep, exhausted from the day's flight. Merith placed the torches together to make a small fire and put on some food to warm. Henry and Lexa sat apart, speaking in low voices, which was fine with Gregor. Merith was the only one he felt like talking to anyway. So you can tell the crawlers apart, Merith? Oh, wait. So can you tell the crawlers apart, Merith? Asked Gregor. He dumped all his batteries on the ground to sort out the dead ones while they talked. No, it is most rare that your sister can. Among us are a few that can make distinctions. Vicus is better than most. But to pick one from so many, it is passing strange, said Merith. Perhaps it is a gift of the overlanders? He suggested. No, they look identical to me, said Gregor. Boots was really good at those games where they gave you four pictures that looked alike, except one had a tiny difference. Like there were four party hats and one had seven stripes instead of six. And if they were all drinking from paper cups, she always knew whose was whose, even if they got mixed up on the table together. Maybe every roach really did look distinctly different to her. Gregor opened up the flashlight. It took two D-sized batteries. He swapped the other batteries in and out, trying to determine which one still had power. <sighs> As he worked, he inadvertently flipped the switch on when the flashlight was pointing at Luxa and Henry. They jumped, unaccustomed to sudden bursts of light. He did it a couple more times on purpose, which was childish, but he liked seeing them flinch. They'd last about five seconds in New York City, he thought. That made him feel a little better. Of the tin batteries, all but two still had juice. Gregor opened up the compartment of his hat and found it ran on some special rectangular battery. Not having any replacements, he would have to use it sparingly. Maybe I should save this for last. If I lose the others or they go dead, I'll still have this on my head, he thought. He clicked off the light on the hat. Gregor put the good batteries back in his pocket and set the other two aside. Those are two our duds, he said to Merith. They don't work. Shall I burn them? asked Merith, reaching for the batteries. Gregor caught his wrist before he could toss them in the flames. No, they might explode. He didn't really know what would happen if you put a battery in the fire, but he had a vague memory of his dad saying it was a dangerous thing to do. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught Lux and Henry exchanging uneasy glances. You could blind yourself, he added, just for effect. Well, that might happen if they exploded. Merith nodded and gingerly set the batteries back by Gregor. He rolled them around with his sandal, making Luxa and Henry nervous, but when he saw that Merith looked nervous too, he stuck the duds in his pocket. Vicus and Zolovit returned just as the food was ready. They looked worried. Everyone gathered around as Merith passed out fish, bread, and something that reminded Gregor of a sweet potato, but wasn't. 
Boo, it's dinner time, said Gregor, and she ran over. When she realized they weren't following, she turned her head and waved impatiently to the roaches. Tim, Tika, Dinna! An awkward social moment. No one else had thought to invite the roaches. Meredith had not prepared enough food. Clearly, it wasn't standard to dine with roaches. Fortunately, they shook their heads. No, princess, we eat not now. And they started to scurry away. Stay there, said Boots, pointing at Tim and Tick. You stay there, big bugs. And the roaches obediently sat down. Boots, said Gregor, embarrassed. You don't have to stay. She orders everybody around, he told the roaches. It's just she wants to keep playing with you, but she has to eat first. We will sit, said one stiffly, and Gregor had the feeling the bug wanted him to mind his own business. Everyone ate hungrily except Ficus, who seemed distracted. So when we leave, that asked Henry through a mouthful of fish. We do not, said Sullivan. The crawlers have refused to come. Lux's head snapped up indignantly and refused on what grounds. They do not wish to invite the anger of King Georger by joining our quest, said Vicus. They have peace with both humans and rats now, and they do not want to unseat it. Well, now what? thought Gregor. They needed two roaches. It said so in the prophecy of Grey. If the roaches didn't come, could they still rescue his father? We have asked them to rethink the proposition, said Sullivan. They know the rats are on the march. This may sway them in our direction. Or... In the rats, mother Luxa, and Gregor secretly agreed. The roaches had debated trading overlanders to the rats, even when they knew the rats would eat them, and that yet was yesterday, when there was no war. If Boots hadn't been so appealing, no doubt they would be dead now. The roaches weren't fighters. Gregor thought they would do what was best for their species, and the rats were probably the stronger ally, or they would be if you could trust them. What makes the roaches think they can believe the rats? asked Gregor. The crawlers do not think in the same manner we do, said Vicus. How do they think? asked Gregor. Without reason or consequence, Henry broke in angrily. They are the stupidest of creatures in the Underland. Why, they can barely even speak. Silence, Henry, said Vicus sharply. Gregor glanced back at Temp and Tick, but the roaches gave no sign they had heard. Of course they had. The roaches didn't seem too bright, but it was just rude to say it in front of them. Besides, that wasn't going to make them want to come along. Remember you, when Sandwich arrived in the Enderland, the crawlers had been here for countless generations. No doubt they will remain when all of warm blood has passed, said Vicus. That is rumor, said Henry dismissively. No, it's not. Cockroaches have been around like 350 million years and people haven't been here, have been and people haven't even been here six, said Gregor. His dad had showed him a timeline of when different animals had evolved on Earth. He remembered being impressed by how old cockroaches were. How do you know this? Luxa spoke abruptly, but Gregor could tell she was actually interested. It's science. Archaeologi archaeologists dig up fossils and stuff, and they can tell how old things are. Cockroaches, I mean crawlers are really old and they've never changed much said gregor he was getting on shaky ground here but he thought that was true they're pretty amazing he hoped Timp and tick were listening ficus smiled at him for a creature to survive so long it is no doubt as smart as it needs to be i do not believe in your science said henry the crawlers are weak they cannot fight they will not last that is how nature intended it Gregor thought of his grandma, who was old and dependent on the kindness of stronger people now. He thought of Boots, who was little and couldn't yet open a door. But there was his friend Larry, who had to go to the hospital emergency room three times last year when his asthma flared up and he couldn't get air into his lungs. Is that what you think, Lexa? said Gregor. Do you think something deserves to die if it's not strong? It doesn't matter what I think if that is the truth, said Lexa evasively. But is it the truth? That is an excellent question for the future ruler of Regalia to ponder, said Vicus. They ate quickly and Vicus suggested they all try to sleep. Gregor had no idea if it was night or not, but he felt tired and he didn't object. While he spread out a thin woven blanket at the edge of the chamber, Boots tried to teach Timp and Tick to play patty cake. The roaches waved their front legs in confusion, not understanding what was going on. Pat cake, pat cake, bake a man. Bake me a cake as fast as you can. Pat it, pick it, mark with a B. Put it in oven for a big bug and me, sang Boots as she clapped and touched the roach's feet. The bugs were completely baffled. What sings the princess? What sings? asked Tim. Or maybe it was Tig. It's a song we sing with babies in the Overland, said Gregor. She put you in it. That's a big honor, he said. She only puts someone in a song if she really likes them. Me like big bug, said Boots with satisfaction. And the song again sang and sang the song again with the roaches. Sorry, guys, 
She has to sleep now, said Gregor. Come on, Boots, sleepy time, say good night. Boots spontaneously hugged the roaches. Night, big bug, sleep tight. Gregor was glad she left out don't let the bed bugs bite. Gregor snuggled down with her under the blanket on the hard stone floor. After a long nap, she wasn't very sleepy. He let her play with the flashlight a while, clicking it on and off, but he was afraid she'd run down the batteries, and it was making the underlanders restless. Finally, he got her to settle down and sleep. As he drifted off, he thought he heard Timp, or maybe it was Tick whispering, Honors us? The princess honors us? He didn't know what woke him by the stiffness in his neck. He must have been lying on the hard floor for hours. He drowsily reached over to pull Boots' warm body next to him, but he only found cold snow. His eyes snapped open and he sat up. His lips parted to call her name as his vision came into focus, but no sound came out. Boots was in the center of the big round chamber, rocking from foot to foot as she turned calmly in a circle. The flashlight she held illuminated the room in sections. He could see the figure stretching out in every direction in perfect concentric rings. They swayed in unison, some to the left, some to the right, with slow, mesmerizing movements. In total silence, hundreds of cockroaches were dancing around Boots. And that's the end of chapter 14. Wow. So hundreds and hundreds of cockroaches are dancing around boots. Good thing, bad thing, I don't know. So today for your assignment, you are going to tell me four facts and four opinions about Gregor the Overlander. Facts are something we can prove. Remember, the author is Suzanne Collins. That's something we can prove. It's book one in the series. That's something we can prove. The main character is Gregor the Overlander. Gregor the Overlander is 11. Those are all things we can prove. And then I want you to write four opinions about Gregor. These are your opinions, maybe. Maybe it's Gre some of Gregor's opinions from the book. Maybe it's some of Vicus's or Luxa's opinions from the book or your opinions about the book. So when you fill that out, you get four facts and four opinions, turn it right in. Remember, all of them have to be about our book in some way. All right, love you guys so much. Have a great day.